Welcome everyone. So sorry for the delay as we uh, looked in our pockets for a device that was actually in the bag it was supposed to be of the entire time. <laughs> um, I want to thank everyone so much for coming out. It is a beautiful day and I so much appreciate your being here. I'm Anna Litton, the Assistant Director of Libraries here at the Robbins Library and I am very excited to host today's program. Um, a conversation with Duncan White about his book, Cold Warriors, Writers Who Wage the Literary Cold War. Um, I get a lot of proposals from members of the community. Oh, people call me all the time. I'd like to present on my book. I'd like to show my art show. All kinds of stuff that people would like to show at the library. And I think very carefully before I say yes, because I get so many pitches. Uh, the reason, when Duncan first contacted me and said he'd like to present about his book here at the library, I said, okay, well, let me do a little research. And uh, a note for all of you writers, make sure your publisher is as good as his. The thing that convinced me to invite Duncan to present here um, was the piece from his publisher about the book. Cold Warriors is a welcome reminder that in a moment when ignorance is celebrated and reading seen as increasingly irrelevant, writers and books can change the world. That is so much what we try to do here at the library. We try to offer for the public uh, books and ideas that can help change the world. So I'm so excited to hear this presentation. The other thing that we do here at the library is connect the community. And it's always a special joy when we can invite somebody to present here at the library who is a member of our community. Uh, Duncan White is an award-winning academic and journalist and the assistant director of the History and Literature Program at Harvard University. He was educated at the universities of Cambridge, London, and Oxford, and has previously taught at Wellesley College. He has lived uh, in Arlington with his family since 2012. We invited him today to join us in a conversation with James Ballon of ACMI, our community partner and another organization in town that has a deep invested interest in showing Arlingtonians what other Arlingtonians are doing and the chance to uh, learn more about Duncan's book and to hear that conversation um, at, with, with James is truly uh, a treat for us all. As ACMI's communication manager, James oversees all communications between ACMI and the Arlington community. He also hosts the number of talk show series produced by ACMI's public affairs department. We're excited to hear from both of them. As you may have noticed, we are filming this event. People will not be seeing really the camera is only uh, catching our two uh, conversationalists today. So if anyone has any worries, you will not appear in um, the uh, video of today's event, but it will be available on ACMR later. I want to thank everyone for coming today and welcome our two speakers. Oh, we are having a few technical difficulties, so bear with us. <laughs> Um, thanks very much, Anna. I really appreciate it. Um, one of the reasons that I was so keen to present here was that actually in the early stages of writing this book, um, I was, I'd left Wellesley and I was looking for work and I was thinking about all sorts of different options and I decided to, um, to try and pitch to write a book, a book that I'd been thinking about writing for a little while. And um, a lot of that was written here at the Robbins Library using the books uh, that were available in the stacks here. And so I've always felt a very sort of strong connection to, to Robbins and sort of feel very strongly that we're very privileged to have such a great library system in Arlington in the Greater Boston area and um, that we shouldn't really take that sort of thing for granted. It's, it's, so it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Anna, so much for all your help in setting it up. Um, I'm joined by Khrushchev and the three budgies. Uh, <laughs> we'll try and go through some of these pictures. I'm gonna start by just looking through some of the photographs, some of these are in the book itself, um, to give you a sense of what the book is about um, uh, and, and to give you a sense of the kind of stories I'm trying to tell. This, this book, I, I'm, I'm an academic, but this book wasn't written for other scholars. This book was written with a sort of general reader in mind. I, I want to make this history feel kind of compelling to people who are interested in history, are interested in the history of literature, who may have read Orwell and Green and McCarthy or Solzhenitsyn and, and, and wanted to explore a little more. Um, so the Cold War, I mean, as a, as, a, as a child of the 1980s, I sort of got the tail end of the Cold War. Um, to me, it was always, when I thought the Cold War, it was always about nuclear weapons. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
the Berlin Wall, all these kind of seismic geopolitical events. And literature didn't really seem to play much of a part in that. Literature was the thing that I studied, the thing that I was passionate about. Um, and it was only as I began to read more, began to meet, read more about the history of the period that I discovered that it wasn't just about Gorbachev and Reagan, that actually the Cold War had been a cultural Cold War, that there had been a battle of ideas waged on both sides of the Iron Curtain between the sort of the Western democratic capitalist ideology on one side and on the other, the ideas of communism, uh, of, of more broadly speaking, socialism. And the stakes of that battle were pretty high. They were, they were about deciding what we, how we should organize our societies. So we'll try and dodge the budgies. Here, that's the sort of, this was the sort of image that um, I associated with the Cold War growing up. This is a different kind of weapon. This is um, a series of weather balloons that were released in West Germany um, containing uh, a precious cargo. That cargo was copies of Animal Farm by George Orwell, translated into Polish. And the idea was, and this is the mid 50s, that um, the CIA, who were funding this operation, would float these copies of this famous novel into um, uh, Warsaw Pact territory, and that the, uh, uh, the readers of this book would have their world's view shaken and changed and Polish farmers would maybe rise up against the, the Communist Party. I mean, it's a, a, a naive and perhaps idealistic uh, uh, way of thinking about things, but it showed quite how um, seriously the, the, the CIA and by extension the State Department, also the, the, the governments in uh, the UK, in France, in Germany, took the idea of uh, culture and literature in particular as a weapon in the Cold War. Um, and that was partly because of what had happened in the 1930s. Um, the rise of um, National Socialism, the Nazi Party, um, and the way that that ideology had expressed itself in the destruction of books, book burnings in the, uh, uh, in, in the public square, um, had really uh, been something that had shaken ideals of what, what, what capitalism could do. Um, the Great Depression had obviously played a large role in all of this. Um, but by the same token, so on the, heart, on the right, you had this kind of attack on literature. And then on the left, you had the rise of Stalinism. So the Russian Revolution had happened in 1917. Um, and then Stalin had come to power after a, a power struggle and he had started to impose very sort of strict rules about what kind of books could be made and what kind of books could be read. Um, these two guys uh, with some impressive facial hair on the right, that's Maxim Gorky, who was the most famous Russian writer in the first half of the 20th century, and that's Shdarnov, who was a um, kind of very sinister and scary uh, Kremlin uh, apparatchik. And between the, the two of them at the 1934 Soviet Writers' Conference, this huge gathering of writers, basically a set of rules were established about what could and couldn't be published. And what could be published was stuff that basically was aligned with what the state wanted, with what was good for communism. Fewer than 50% of the writers that attended survived till the next one, mm -hmm. 10 years later, mm -hmm. because um, they were so brutally punished. Um, one of them, whose story I tell in the book, is Isaac Babel, a writer who is perhaps um, unjustly neglected because he really is one of the, the great writers of the 20th century, but he was um, executed in uh, uh, the basement of the Lubyanka prison in Moscow. But not because he wrote really sort of writing that dissented, but that he refused to align himself with um, the ideas of what a writer should be. Um, it was a way... <laughs> It was a kind of total control um, that, that Stalin uh, sought. So this is this is Stalin here, and um, uh, with with his kind of uh, um, closest uh, uh, political allies, including um, uh, Molotov, and then the the guy on the left there is the Hedgehog, uh, as he was known, the Stalin's Iron Fist, who um, was responsible for much of the purges, including. 
the death of Babel. Um, there's the same photo uh, uh, when he himself got perched a few mm -hmm. years later. So mm -hmm. there was this idea that you were um, being erased from history because there was only one kind of story to tell. And literature played a big role in telling that story. Um, meanwhile, so while this kind of purging is going on in, in the Soviet Union in the 30s, and while the Nazis are burning books, imprisoning writers, German writers going into exile, especially German Jewish writers, a war is happening in Spain um, that is also going to define a lot of people's politics and define um, a lot of the, the, the ideas that went into the Cold War, that the Spanish Civil War. Again, there was rising fascism, and uh, it was a war that really captured people's imaginations. Actually, probably not until Vietnam was there another war that really kind of seized the imaginations of a whole generation of writers. A lot of them went out there to fight, um, including George Orwell, who, once the budgies disappear, you will see his head poking up at the back there, much taller than all the, uh, um, uh, the other, frankly, mostly teenagers who he was uh, volunteering to fight alongside. Um, these guys went out to fight fascism in a kind of quite um, idealistic way. And um, a lot of them saw frontline action. Uh, Orwell was shot through the neck himself, uh, was lucky to survive, um, which is one of the stories I tell in the book. Um, there's Orwell, there's Stephen Spender, another um, a writer who went out um, to fight in Spain. But what they saw there actually was, was not just Francoist totalitarianism, they also came um, face to face with Stalinism and with Stalin's um, attempt to um, sort of control what was going on by proxy, using his intelligence agents and uh, uh, the Spanish Communist Party to try and gain control. And Orwell particularly was horrified by this and went on to write the, his famous books that kind of attack totalitarianism um, from all kind of political angles. And in the Second World War, which you know, was a kind of development of this kind of fight with fascism in Spain um, and uh, Nazi aggression, the idea of books and literature became a really important part of the, the American and British allied um, propaganda strategy. They wanted to attack the fact that um, uh, the, the, the Nazis were waging this war on culture um, and this kind of powerful idea that you know, if you start burning books, eventually you'll start burning people, which was something that um, you know, obviously proved prophetically true um, and tragically so. Um, a lot of writers were out in the Second World War, that's Ernest Hemingway, and there was a real sense of, um, with American triumph, uh, 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 a new way of thinking about the United States and the world. Um, Hemingway was symbolic of the kind of confident, young, cosmopolitan Americans that were um, that gone out and fought in the Second World War, he, a little excessively in his case, and um, uh, resulted in this kind of new idea of well, what uh, American culture could be. You know, a lot of the rest of the world thought of American culture as being to do with things like Mickey Mouse and Coca-Cola and Hollywood, um, and um, it, with this new American century dawning, um, there was a real sense that the US needed to project a more um, sophisticated image of what its culture was, and one that was actually more reflective of the great American writers and, and, and the richness of American culture, from abstract expressionism to William Faulkner. So, <laughs> kind of incredibly, the CIA got involved in promoting all this stuff. They kept it secret that their involvement uh, uh, w that the involvement CIA was, was there and that the money came from uh, the State Department and intelligence services. But things like the Congress for Cultural Freedom, that's Arthur Kustler, who's an outspoken uh, right, uh, uh, leader of the movement, um, became these huge networks of um, uh, writers, publishers, and they attended, uh, they, they hosted um, conferences, they, they um, subsidized publishing houses in over 180 countries around the world. And it was a real kind of cultural onslaught um, to try and persuade people that democratic capitalism was the way forward to try and resist communism in the aftermath of the Second World War. Maybe we can see if we can get through. Meanwhile, in Russia, of course, writers like Akhmatova and Pasternak were being um, 
uh, continuing to be to be persecuted and silenced, and that actually became part of the the, the conflict was. Uh, Western forces seeking to promote works like Dr. Zhivago. The CIA published special editions of Dr. Zhivago um, when it came out, really because it was banned in the Soviet Union. And so as the Cold War deepening crisis, this is the Berlin Wall going up, Cuban Missile Crisis, both happening in the early 1960s, you start to get people who took the Cold War as a subject itself, like Graham Greene, John le Carré, and a new genre of kind of Cold War spy fiction sprang up that was far more cynical about the way that the, the, the sort of the, the secretive aspects of the Cold War were being, were being waged in Cuba, in Berlin, and then ultimately in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, Vietnam, like I mentioned before, was a kind of interesting sequel to the Spanish Civil War in that writers like Mary McCarthy went out um, to challenge uh, the kind of the, the, the accounts of, that were being given by the state about what was going on. Um, a lot of them had been actually involved in the Congress for Cultural Freedom and all these kind of CIA organizations. And when that came out, at the same time as the, the Vietnam War intensified, a lot of them sought to kind of find a way to regain their, their, their uh, honor, if anything, by reporting on the truth of what's happening in Vietnam. And then finally, you get the unraveling of the Cold War, um, uh, where dissidents writers who kind of stood up to the Kremlin, like Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Václav Havel, um, defied um, the powers that be and the intelligence services that were trying to intimidate them, the KGB, um, to become uh, real leaders, and in Havel's case, the head of state in, in leading the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, so that writers themselves it became this focal point of the kind of dissent, because they'd been suppressed for so long, actually led to the collapse of communism and um, eventually the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Okay, that's a very quick run through of what is uh, an embarrassingly long book. Um, and uh, if any of those images raise questions, I can't speak to those three, um, <laughs> but I can speak to the rest of it. I'll, I'll be happy to um, ask more. Anna already introduced me. Um, my name is James Milan, and I do work at ACMI, um, which is your local cable television station. Hopefully most of you know that. Um, for those of you who um, may know people who will be very interested in the subject matter here, but are out enjoying the day or out of town or something like that, it will be important to remember that this is being recorded and we will be showing it on ACMI in the coming weeks and months um, for you to revisit it if you'd like or for others who'd be interested. You can access our, uh, you can find out what's on our channels either through The Advocate if you happen to get that. Um, we have our schedule in there every week or you can go to our website acmi.tv and find um, and just go to On Demand there and you'll be able to find this conversation. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Um, I did want to say that Many of the lines of inquiry that I'm going to pursue are going to be more general than asking about specific writers, and that's mm. for two reasons. One, I figure as you're answering the questions that I have, um, you're going to be referencing those writers sure. and some of the great stories that you tell in the book. Um, and then secondly, uh, we are going to have a period of question and answer from the audience um, to close out the uh, event today, and I'll bet that you guys also will have some questions related to specific writers, and so I feel like that will likely be covered. Right. Um, one of the people reviewing your book um, acknowledged, as you kind of alluded to in your introduction, that there are, the Cold War was waged on a lot of different fronts, right? Geopolitical, uh, ideological, religious mm -hmm. even, and um, you chose, uh, and military of course, and uh, but you chose literature, and I'd like to start off by asking why why that choice? I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, partly, I mean, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. There's one that's, that comes from my interest and my background, which is in literary studies and thinking about why literature is kind of important in the world. We're in a sort of situation in which... Um, uh, the study of the humanities is in crisis in universities. We've got declining enrollments um, at higher education ins institutions. And you could argue a concomitant 
decline in critical thinking um, uh, uh, around the world, which is reflected in perhaps some of our contemporary politics and some of the challenges that we face in educating young people about you know, being able to read closely the things that are, that are presented to them. Um, so I wanted to write a book that really showed how important literature could be. And um, the Cold War was a period when literature, for, for whatever you may think of it, was taken incredibly seriously by um, the powers that be, by the CIA and the KGB, by the Kremlin and the White House. Um, so I wanted to sort of ask why. You know, it seemed very strange that they should invest so much um, uh, power in these, in, in novels, in stories. Um, and the more I dug into it, the more I kind of discovered that 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 literature had not only been sort of influential, but had been really actually weaponized in these kind of really instrumental ways. And I thought that was a really fascinating story to tell to a, especially to a generation who you know think of warfare in the context of you know drones and 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 cyber attacks and these sorts of things this was kind of a, a fascinating story to tell i thought mm -hmm. yeah and i do want to return to that in in mm. in uh, in a few minutes um before that though i noticed that you structured the book um first chronologically um mm. but also um with the decision clearly to focus on a kind of narrative history form. So you're yeah. telling uh, a lot of writers specific, if not entire biographies, then, then partial biographies, and certainly their specific stories. Yeah. So I'm wondering, again, why you would have chosen that particular approach to tackling this very kind of sprawling history um, yeah. and what you found in so doing. Um, so it was a real headache <laughs> um, because it was kind of like trying to cast a movie right? You, you've, got, you've got all these writers and you've got this story you want to tell. And initially I wanted to tell the story thematically, but when, when I first started working with my editor at, at, at Little Brown, actually, in the UK, he, he said that, you know, that's going to be really hard for people to follow. You're going to be jumping back and forward in history and you can't really assume people know all this, 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 this stuff. You need to tell the story. And so we came up with this idea of a group biography. And hopefully if you pick the right writers, you would be able to sort of weave through history and tell all the stories of the different events that happened. And that's, that kind of was quite easy in one sense in that you, you think, oh, well, George Orwell, you know, he's right at the heart of this. And Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he's, he makes a lot of sense. But then it was, you know, how do I tell the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis? How do I tell the story of the Berlin Wall? And, and so it was about trying to find the writers whose biographies could do that. Because I really thought in, in, in telling this history, I wanted to make it personal. I want to show how the writers were um, engaged in kind of you know, dangerous lives, writing dangerous books, taking great risks. It's a lot of, there has been, you know, th books written about the Cold War that tend to focus on the institutions and, and the way that those institutions acted upon people. And that tends to sort of flatten the, the, the sort of the, 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 the human character out of the story. You know, they, these, um, these writers were conflicted, they were hypocritical, they were very brave, they made mistakes, they were inconsistent. And I really, I felt that was a really important part of the story to tell, to show how um, kind of individual agency and the, 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 the way that these characters thought about the world, these, these, these writers thought about it, uh, came into conflict with these larger powers, you know, these, and these um, larger institutions and agencies. And, <laughs> And, but the problem was the cast kept getting bigger <laughs> because, you know, there were more stories to tell and I had a lot of history to cover. But I was kind of reassured, strangely enough, by Game of Thrones because, you know, <laughs> people love so that show. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but there's a huge cast and people can follow all these different interlinking stories seemingly. And so I thought, you know, that's fine. Well, we can, it doesn't have to be just two or three. We can, we can have a cast of 20, which is roughly where it ended up. Yeah. yeah, and you're, you're, you're right, that is a little serendipitous that your, your intensive work in this book kind of coincided with the primacy of Game of Thrones, which does show us that it is, it's been a surprise to me, actually, how many people of so many different ages can follow multiple storylines diligently yeah. uh, for a really long well, period of time. So What everyone thinks of that show, it's a, it's a wonderful example of sustained and complex storytelling. 
And, you know, I thought, you know, it, I mean, it wasn't a sort of direct model by any means, but it, it shows how, you know, hungry people are for that kind of uh, way of telling stories. The Wire is another great example of, you know, incredibly complex overlapping stories. And I think a lot of what's being done in TV is really interesting. So I had the idea of wanting to do narrative history, which somewhat kind of frowned upon in the academy sometimes um, because I, I, I thought people would respond to it. Yeah, and I am a little curious, especially because I also have uh, both uh, graduate studies in history and in literature in my own background. So this was particularly fascinating to me that you're kind of navigating this these kind of this interstitial area between you know literature and history. Did you find that that in the end, now that you've done it and you have your book, mm. did you do you do you see that as as pretty successfully done and that they reflected well on each other? Uh, in the way that you were hoping for, or 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 what? Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I can't really judge the success of it myself. But what I what I do every day with my students, I teach in an interdisciplinary department. So I work with students and try and teach them how to think about history and culture at the same time. Actually, think about them as not being distinct. You know, a lot of the way that we teach the humanities is to sort of categorize things separately and to think about. History, sociology, uh, um, well, not the humanities, but social sciences, the, the literature and, and um, these different subjects, different cultures even, should be kind of taught and understood separately. And I think inter interdisciplinary studies is something that's actually making a lot of headway in, in education at all levels at the moment. And so it's what I do every day with my students. I'm teaching them, I'm trying to model this in, in the way that I, uh, I, I talk about books and, and historical moments in the classroom to think about how things are represented as much as the sort of the historical facts behind them. Mm. And so it was, it felt very a natural extension of that work, a natural extension of my teaching to, to write in, in, in this kind of way and to, to think about literature and history as being, um, you know, two sides of the same coin rather than sort of distinct disciplines. So anybody who has seen the book, knows there's there's plenty to it, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, wh what I will say, though, is that there are two themes kind of jumped out at me. Mm. Um, uh, one of them being the relationship between art and the broader context in which that art is being produced. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is this question of complicity, which to mm. me has been part of the, the human story from earliest times, in fact. So yeah. I'm going to ask you a couple of specific questions about mm. each of those. But I invite you to be as kind of discursive in your answer as, uh, as you'd like and, sure. and also maybe a time, an opportunity to bring up some of the writers that you specifically wrote about. Mm. Um, so I was, I'm wondering if whether probing this dynamic between the making of art and the, play, the, the, the context in which it's happening, um, whether probing that so thoroughly led you to any conclusions um, mm -hmm. about an artist's responsibility mm -hmm to his or her art and also to the world around them mm. and and you know where you, where you ended up with 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 that um that's a really interesting subject so at the same time as all this stuff was happening in the way that literature was taught and the way that in in classrooms in high schools in the US in 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 universities um there was this really strong idea that sort of you should appreciate literature outside of its context, right? That, it, that literature was a sort of discrete, self-contained thing. You read a book and you read it within the rules that the book establishes for itself. And that's kind of a very appealing way of thinking about literature in some senses. A lot of writers still buy into that idea that when they, they write for within their world and then when it goes out into that world, the consequences are kind of not really on them. It's much... I think murkier than that, it's less kind of clear cut than that. And so a lot of the challenges the writers that I was um, talking about faced was they were writing in a time when there was real ideological division in the world. And when they put a book out that kind of um, seemed to support one of those sides, um, it would inevitably oppose the other. Or if they put out a book that opposed one side, it would be supported by the other. A great example is George Orwell's um, 1984, which um, has, has since become a sort of a, a, a favorite book of sort of libertarians and the John Birch Society and kind of quite hard right 
um, uh, uh, political groups because it was seen as an attack on exclusively on Soviet communism. Actually, it was an attack on, yes, Soviet totalitarianism, but also um, what was wrong with um, the sort of democratic West. George Orwell believed in kind of social democracy, essentially. So, but he had no real, you know, he would have thought he had no real control over what happened with his book. But as you sort of get into the details of it, you see that, you know, he did um, sort of, uh, uh, not exactly collaborate, but like he was complicit in some of his activities that, that that leave a bad taste in the mouth now. I mean, he was involved, for example, in drawing up a list of names of writers who he felt were sort of communist fellow travelers or suspicious in one way or another. And he gave that to something called the Information Research Department, which was associated with MI6 and British intelligence. I have so, to say the information research department sounds like one that he could have come up with. Yeah, in exactly. One of his books, so. so, you know, you th he, there, there is I mean, it's really, it's really troubling that stuff. In the same, you know, at the other end, you had Soviet dissidents who would write, you know, in uh, uh, incredibly um, pressured conditions, these novels, smuggle them out at great risk to themselves and the people that were helping. But they couldn't prevent those, even if they were essentially interested in reforming the Soviet Union rather than sort of championing the West, their works were picked up by the CIA and championed in various different ways. And it was impossible for them to remain apolitical or to, to be able to control the consequences of, uh, of what happened to their books. So complicity just was kind of inevitable. And it was inevitable partly because literature was taken so seriously. I mean, it's hard to be complicit if people aren't taking literature that seriously because the stakes are so much lower. So as the stakes got higher, it was very difficult to avoid getting caught up in uh, um, the ideological Cold War in one way or another. Yeah, so I am wondering, of course, this is not what you set out to do, nor probably how you would see your own book. But I think people are always interested in good guys and bad guys. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering when it comes to complicity, when it comes to um, you know taking stands against the tide, um, et cetera, you, you cover a score of writers in, in good detail and then many, many others in your book. Um, who are the heroes mm. and the villains that you would like to call out and on what basis? I mean, there are some people that are like uncomplicated villains, right? <laughs> people who were just pretty shabby individuals. Um, Alexander Fedayev was a writer in the Soviet Union who just stitched everybody up and, and was informing on everybody to the KGB and, um, you know, was Im implicated in, in, in the deaths of many of his, so you know, supposed friends. So you have people that really on that, you know, the real sort of toadies on, on, the, on that end of things. And you also have, um, there are some there are some writers who 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 were kind of brave in the things in the kind of actions they took in their lives. I'm thinking here of um, Arthur Kessler, you know, who who you know was in a, a jail in Franco Spain, who was chased around France by the Nazis, was in an internment camp uh, in which he wrote part of Darkness at Noon, then was managed to flee to the the United Kingdom. Um, and was then imprisoned by the British because he'd been a communist agent in his earlier, uh, uh, in, in an earlier iteration. Um, but he was also absolutely appalling to everybody in his life, especially women, you know, um, really, uh, you know, uh, uh, reprehensible in his, in his kind of personal life. So it's very hard. You can sort of admire a book that um, the, some aspects of their life, but, you know, find them kind of unpleasant. There's very few that kind of come out you know, wholly uh, um, uh, sort of morally pure and, and, and... Surprise. Yeah, I know. I mean, even Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn is probably the, the bravest writer in this book, right? He, he single-handedly took on the Kremlin and was just totally fearless. But then you, <laughs> when he came over here, he gave this commencement speech at Harvard where he just told them all off for listening to rock and roll and, and like having fun and all that stuff. <laughs> and he was a real sort of moral puritan and a kind of uh, quite a hardline religious guy. So, you know, I didn't I mean, his idea of what Russia should be was terrifying. Like, you know, if he'd actually 
achieve this kind of weird Slavic ethno state that was, you know, celebrated the Orthodox Church, I don't think anybody would have been happy. But he was incredibly brave. I mean, I will say, you know, I like very much the people that I like in my book, Mary McCarthy, who was, you know, made tons of mistakes and, uh, you know, got got stuff wrong, but was is very kind of engaging and and ended up in the right place eventually. It was fearless too. Um, and Isaac Babel, the guy that died in the uh, um, in the Gulag or in the in the purges, he he was um, he was kind of he was even cracking jokes with the KGB as they took him off. Like he he sort of remained <laughs> um, a, a, a kind of endearing character. In fact, when he was being um, interrogated, uh, I mean they tortured him. You can see the gaps in the interrogate. They, the, his, his KGB file was um, smuggled out by an intrepid researcher immediately after communism fell. And you can see these gaps where they tortured him. And he comes back and he confesses to crazy stuff like being a spy on Soviet aviation. He'd never even been on a plane. And, you know, um, but then it comes to the sort of the very end, the crux, and, and they've sort of broken him. And, and, and he, he actually, in his final trial where he was supposed to just to admit to all these trials. He, 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 he actually tried to clear the names of everybody he'd implicated and said that he'd been, you know, he'd been tortured and he'd lied under pressure. And there was no audience there and he probably thought no one would ever see that. Mm -hmm. But that took tremendous courage to, 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 to do that. And it's of a piece with um, who he was as a, as a person, I think. Yeah, I mean, a truly noble act, obviously, mm -hmm. that. Um, but also I am struck by the fact that you told the the story in that answer of both Kessler and Babel. Kessler mm. lives long enough, as mm. it turns out, to you know suffer the consequences of his earlier behavior mm. and also to reveal himself as, again, kind of reprehensible in the way that he treats people. Mm. Um, Babel, um, unfor you know, tragically yeah. died early, but also mm -hmm. purer in that way, as far That's as we true. know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting how that can play out, too. It, it does. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, the, the the martyrs can sometimes um, you know we can look at them through rose tinted glasses. I think you know in Babel's case he was not somebody who was particularly self aggrandizing. He was very sort of ironic in his treatment of himself. But you know there's other people who you know I, like Graham Greene, who I, whose books are magnificent, but he's not a particularly admirable human being. I mean you you wouldn't necessarily trust him. Um, but the, but then maybe, you know, Le Carre is much more of a, a kind of uh, a, a morally upstanding person who's actually kind of stood up for some of the things that he believes in, even when they, they, they put him under considerable pressure. Well, obviously, there is, another, there is a future 700-page book or more uh, in, in examining that tension between mm. the artist and how he or she, op, you know, actually treats, pe you know, what kind of person <laughs> they are versus what kind of art they produce. Um, and uh, certainly topical. So there you go. Free, <laughs> yeah. free, free uh, suggestion there. Um, I wanted to uh, just wrap up with a couple of more things before we, we turn it over to the audience. Um, mm. And one of those is to ask, is to give voice Mm. Uh, to some of the critiques. When I was reading your mm. book and also what people have written about it, there are a few critiques that emerge, and I mm. wanted to both give voice to those and allow you to, to respond to sure. them and yeah, uh, yeah. give you that opportunity. Um, one of them has to do with the fact that there are a lot of writers depicted within the book, and then there are writers who were left out. Yeah. I'm wondering um, who, if anyone, you might cite Mm. as examples of somebody who could or even maybe should from your vantage point right now yeah, have been included totally yeah i mean it was really hard and you know <laughs> it's long enough as it is the idea of putting more in was and, and but there were there were many more that i wanted to include okay so one was joan didion joan didion um did some incredible uh um literary reportage from places like mm. salvador um, she was really interested in in some of the ways, uh, uh, you know, especially under Nixon, the 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 sort of the grubby, like um, deniable arms of the state were operating around the world. Um, it was it ended up being a very difficult decision to choose between her and Gioconda Belli, who's a Nicaraguan poet that I write about later in the book. Um, 
because Nicaragua and Salvador were so tied up together. If I'd written about them both, it would have sort of really unbalanced the latter half of the book and I'd have had a lot about um, the sort of the crisis in Central America, possibly at the expense of what was going on in the rest of the world. Another writer is, is, a, is perhaps not as well known as he was um, a, a couple of decades ago, but is Richard Kapuscinski, who's a Polish journalist who traveled everywhere in the world. And he was in Angola during the Angolan War of the 1970s, which was another of these proxy conflicts that gets forgotten, which was just unbelievably brutal. The number of people that lost their lives mm -hmm. in, in, this, in this kind of three-way battle. I mean, Cuban forces were involved, um, the, the Americans and the, and the West were helping the South Africans get involved. It was a really, it's a kind of brutal proxy war that I wanted to tell the story of, but it just was too difficult to get, get, get him into. And there were others. I mean, mm -hmm. you could see perhaps a place for Whitaker Chambers, who you know wrote Witness, and to show um, how important writing could be in propping up McCarthyism in the 1950s, as opposed to telling the story of Howard Fast, which I do in the book, who who was one of the writers persecuted by uh, Huac and uh, the House and American Activities Committee and, and McCarthy. Um, there were also a number of other writers like Fast, like Lillian Hellman, a great playwright. She remained pretty loyal to um, Moscow long after many other people had sort of abandoned them. And that's fascinating. And she had a real feud with Mary McCarthy, who's one of the main writers. So that, would, that was really a tough decision. It was between her and Howard Fast because, mm -hmm. again, I didn't want to spend you know, hundreds of pages on, on, on j just the Red Scare. But mm -hmm. um, that would have been a great story it would i think it would have been just as fascinating to tell the story of, of lillian hellman as, as as someone like howard fast well we just you know asked you about people who weren't included and and also a source of controversy is somebody who was yeah. um and that is um you know some people are just curious about not only the fact that he's in there but how much time you give to kim philby and mm. i'll let you go ahead and explain <laughs> both why and who he is and what his significance is so kim philby isn't really a writer well, he isn't a writer. He's a spy. <laughs> um, he was uh, a British spy who I'm sure, as many of you know, was actually secretly working for the Soviet Union. Um, and he was also like not just a spy, but like way high in the hierarchy uh, of MI6, so much so that he was actually coordinating between the British and the Americans. And um, he would helped establish a network of uh, other spies known as the Cambridge spies um, that were... Um, sort of busy hollowing out what was left of British intelligence after the Second World War. He, so the reason I included him is because he's the glue that sticks together uh, a lot of the writers that I'm interested in, but he also represents something about the way that spying and, and writing and literatures, uh, and, and literature kind of um, interconnected in fascinating ways. So he was Graham Greene's boss at MI6 during the Second World War. And they became good friends and Graham Greene ended up writing about some of those experiences later. He was also a figure who obsessed uh, John le Carré um, and became his story became the, essentially the plot of Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy. Um, and he also became the source of contention between Greene and le, le Carré. And it, it was one of... Um, it was a kind of way of thinking about the ethics of the Cold War. You know, Green was happy to think that, that what Philby did was, was kind of okay because it was done out of commitment to what he really believed in. To Le Carre, Philby's crimes were unforgivable. And I really wanted to set that up because for, to, for the ending of the book, when Philby is dying, he asks, he meets both Green and, Le, and uh, well, he meets Green and, and invites Le Carre to come and see him when they visit Gorbachev's Moscow. And he meets with Green and they have a kind of, they reminisce about the old times. And Green had written the foreword to, to Philby's memoir. And then he, when Le Carre's in, in Moscow, he invites Le Carre to come and uh, uh, to meet him with the goal of having Le Carre write hit the second volume of his memoirs, the kind of real true story that's not been kind of shadow written by the KGB. Um, or, or supervised by the KGB, I should say. And Le Carre refuses. 
and it's and despite you know his desperate curiosity to meet this kind of fascinating uh, uh, figure who, who he'd, he'd been obsessed with all his life, he, he refuses to see him because he thinks ultimately that that was that was going too far. And it, and I think that that gets to this some of the idea of uh, of where your where your moral boundaries could be set in the Cold War. And Kim Philby is a great way, I think, of of exploring those and thinking about the way that yeah that. That espionage and deniability and untrustworthiness just kind of sort of bled into the, the fabric of of, uh, uh, of how we think about the Cold War and ultimately how we relate to governments. You know, I mean, and to the state. The it's easy to see how, um, as a Soviet citizen, you would. <laughs> you would, and the, the recent TV series Chernobyl has been a great example of this, be kind of deeply untrust, uh, d deeply distrustful of what the state was doing and what it was telling you and the accounts it gave to you of, uh, of what was true and not. But the Cold War was really when, especially Americans, lost trust in its own government. Um, most spectacularly over Vietnam and, the, and the, the fact that three separate presidents just lied to the to, to public about Vietnam but even earlier with um, uh, with Eisenhower before being kind of lured into these into these kind of lies of convenience into this idea of plausible deniability and you know truth and and and, and how the, the sort of the, the the looseness with which an idea of truth and honesty uh, was treated um, during the Cold War is was fascinating to me and it's obviously something that really plays into the idea of making fiction, making literature, making things up. Um, and then you've got someone like Philby who made everything up for a living, but for very much malign purposes. He made up a whole life for himself. Yeah. Well, no better segue could you have given me than, mm -hmm. uh, than that to the last topic that I want to talk about before we turn it over to the audience, and that is um, the current day. Mm. Um, and the fact that uh, I know that uh, you earlier this week had an op-ed published in the New York Times, mm. congratulations, Thank by you. the way, um, in, in which you discuss uh, the fact that there are authoritarian regimes in multiple places in the world right now mm. uh, doing their level best to silence, mm -hmm. squelch, uh, dissent in every way they can, including um, in the fields of literature and journalism. So I wanted to just, uh, you know, invite you mm. to elaborate either on that or anything else that you see as a, a really strong parallel to mm. the world that we see around us right now. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do in that op-ed was to talk about books in particular, because um, one of the things I, I, I sort of from looking at all these different news stories from you know, Egypt to Turkey to, I mean, obviously places like North Korea and Iran, <laughs> the American uh, prison library, the school libraries that are, that are placed under constant pressure to, to remove books. Um, but really in those authoritarian regimes abroad, um, I was fascinated by how people were starting to really go for books again. Like in, in Putin's Russia, I remember speaking to a writer, a Russian writer, who said that, you know, since, well, first of all, it was, you know, freedom of speech was supposedly part of the Russian constitution after the, after the Soviet Union collapsed. And Putin just didn't seem to care. Like if you wrote books about stuff, he cared about cable TV. Um, he did care about investigative journalists, as many of those journalists found out to their peril. Mm. And um, the internet, right? And when, um, I think a sort of real, uh, inflection point with this was the, the the Arab Spring, when suddenly it was thought of, oh look, you know, the internet is allowing people to organize. People are, uh, are, are able to to rally dissent through Twitter and other media, and um, the internet could be a really powerful force for people to kind of fight back against authoritarian regimes. Um, and that hasn't lasted. In fact, the authoritarian regimes have become very smart at using the internet to monitor people. Um, the most sort of, I don't know whether it's extreme or fascinating example of this is what's happening in China um, with the Uyghur population, the, uh, the Muslim population in, in, in the west of the country, 
who you know are forced to have an app downloaded onto their phones. There's there's like facial recognition technology being um, uh, uh, built in public spaces. Um, China has got a firewall, the Great Firewall, as it's known, that prevents people from accessing certain types of technology. And suddenly, it's, it looks actually like the internet is not actually the, the answer, <laughs> but actually might make things worse for, for dissidents. And in that context, it was fascinating that Beijing chose to crack down on this little bookshop in Hong Kong, it, like basically kidnapped five people who were working in this bookshop, took them to the mainland. There's different legal systems between Hong Kong and. And, as and, we and as we well know now. Well, exactly, and this was this was almost a foreshadowing of what's now happened because this was all about ideas of rendition and how you take people to face legal consequences in these with these two different systems and the, the changes in the law would have made it much easier to grab people like these these booksellers. Apparently, I mean, I've not read them, but apparently a lot of the books they were selling are these kind of salacious portraits of of uh, powerful members of the Communist Party, sort of scan you know sort of scandal fiction stuff. Um, but they felt threatened by this, and that was that sort of fascinated me. Then Turkey, um, Turkey just announced that it had taken three hundred thousand books out of libraries and, and burned them. Um, right, and I, th I believe that you described that in your op-ed as they kind of did it gleefully, you know. Right. Well, it was sort of it was a you know it was part of the purge. It was part of the attack on the political opposition that is perceived to have been led by this guy Gulen, who lives in Pennsylvania. Um, but it's books again, and it's interesting to me that, that, that actually the thing that was supposed to be limiting about books, you know, that they're, they're bulky, it's an old technology, you know, you have to carry them around. Nobody reads them anymore. <laughs> right, and, and that the, the book was dying, which we've heard a lot. But actually, the, you know, books can't, are, 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 are unplugged and can be passed from hand to hand, and that there's an element of trust in who you share it with, and it's very hard to sort of surveil people through through all books in a way that phones and computers and e-readers and whatever you have, it's obviously going to be more problematic. So that struck me as something interesting that, that books are being targeted again. And the, the, the worry is that, um, as we saw in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, that the, the, the response from the White House is very different to what it has been ever since you know, FDR and before him, you know, made uh, uh, sort of the support of political dissent, um, literary freedom of expression, a kind of central plank. Now, you know, I'm fully aware of the many times that the US has got that wrong and the West has been hypocritical, not just the US, the Western Europe too, in which dis dissidents it's decided to support and when and, and for what reason. But, you know, there have been many moments, including w moments in my book, where, where supporting someone like Solzhenitsyn or Havel during detente actually undermined the goals of, of the, the sort of geopolitical goals of the White House or of, of, um, of, of the US's allies, but they felt compelled to do it because it was actually the right thing to do and it was consistent um, with the positions they'd taken previously on Stalinism, on Nazism. Right, and an and actual reflection of real American, oh, I shouldn't put it that way, but of traditional American values. Well, it's you know, in, which, built into the Constitution. Right. So the, 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 the sort of absence of that and the idea that you have uh, a president who sort of doesn't read and doesn't really understand history at all or, uh, or is, doesn't really seem to care about these things, however one feels about um, you know, issues like the economy, um, uh, or even things like immigration, it is, it is the, the ahistoricism of what he does is really dangerous. And it also, if we then show a disregard for um, some of these issues within our own countries, but then also leave, leave hanging uh, dissidents abroad, you know, what, what really is to stop uh, an authoritarian regime um, doing unspeakable things to the people that disagree with it. If if the most that Saudi Arabia got was a slap on the wrist for mm -hmm. for what happened to Khashoggi, and I don't want to talk about that in detail because of the kids here, but like you know the 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 performative violence of what happened to him was 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 what it was about. It was you mm -hmm. know it wasn't just the, yeah, getting rid. That of was them. not incidental. It's the same thing with the 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 killing of. Um, Litvinenko um, in 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 London, in you know, for the the, the the former KGB officer who was defying um, Putin. You don't, 
there are many ways to kill someone you know, using a kind of weapons grade <laughs> chemical agent at a sushi bar in downtown London is, 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 is making a point. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's been revelations this week that, that Trump didn't, has, has refused to sort of back British accounts of, of uh, Soviet intelligence, uh, sorry, Russian intelligence work, uh, FSB intelligence work in, 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 um, in the UK. Well, I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have had my fun, that's for sure. <laughs> now, 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 your guys' turn. Um, the way that we'll do it is just raise your hand and I'll call on you. And I will, for the sake of the recording, just repeat your, your question, even though I'm sure that Duncan will be able to hear it. So just bear with me as we do that, and then, and then Duncan will be yours. Yes, ma'am. Mm. So, would it mean you know, the world was a strong, um, important thing for them? Yeah, so the question is the, the rise, the dramatic rise in mm. literacy in, uh, after the Bolsheviks came to power. Mm. Yeah, and it's a great question and, and a great point to raise in that, you know, the Bolshevik revolutionary was, you know, an, the revolution was an emancipatory project in many ways. This was trying to, you know, the, the lives of ordinary um, Russians under the under the Tsar were miserable, and um, education was a big part of what communism was about: improving literacy and making people's lives better. I mean, it was also uh, a great way of, you know, if you if people were more literate, then you know, if, if you wanted to communicate a certain message, it was much easier to communicate that message to them too. Um, but I don't think we need to be that cynical about it. I mean, there were many aspects of communism that were, were um, yeah, emancipatory and thinking about social justice and, and making a fairer society. Um, and literacy is a spectacular example of that. You know, there's another, it was funny, I was listening to something the other day, uh, Another regime that, that was incredible in increasing literacy was Saddam Hussein's in uh, Iraq. You know, literacy under Saddam uh, uh, increased at a similar sort of rate. Again, he's, his was started off as this kind of emancipatory uh, uh, project, uh, as, a, as a project of about kind of you know raising people's expectations and, and, and trying to create a, um, a more literate society. So. That was true, and, and, and you know, l f perhaps for that reason, literature was and remains incredibly powerful um, in the Russian national imagination, more so than we can ever really appreciate. You know, you go, you travel around Russia and Eastern Europe, you see the statues of great writers, uh, uh, you know, in, in major squares all over the place, Pushkin especially in Russia, you know, um, especially uh, resonant for them. Um, the problem was, of course, is that, that Stalin used that literacy um, to his own ends as, uh, as this, you know, it was a totalitarian regime that he wanted to establish. He wanted to control all aspects. He was incredibly uh, fastidious in doing so. I mean, he, he read everything. And uh, some of the evidence that has come out since the collapse of the Soviet Union is just how controlling he was over the fates of individual poets and dramatists and writers and he was also ghost writing op-eds in in Pravda and places uh, because he was so intent on on controlling the message that went out there um, so yeah I hope that answers your question okay. I hope that answers your question <laughs> Mm -hmm. and well in in 1984 that you know what Winston does or the department he's in is sort of translating old works of literature into new speak you know into a more simplified easier uh, more digestible version but you know there's also I mean I you know that obviously what I wrote about in um, for the New York Times was kind of 
pretty pessimistic in some senses, but the, you know, independent bookshops are doing pretty well. Like book sales are doing pretty well. Like fiction is still selling uh, at, at encouraging levels, especially actually in the UK and, and the US. You know, the, the, this library is full all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There is, there are, there are some good signs, especially people re, like trying to re-engage with ideas of um, culture and history in in these embattled times. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hey, hey, Max. So the the question relates to the pro proliferation in our mm -hmm. world of information, both reliable and unreliable. Yeah. And uh, what does that do to uh, you know to people's sense of trust in the information that they're hearing? It's, it's fascinating because it is something that is so different um, between these eras. I mean, one one thing that's always interesting is is to think about how how much of a communal culture people of my generation or even of my parents' generation had compared to the, the culture of, of the students that I teach. Um, so, you know, in the United States in the 50s and 60s, there were three television channels. And so everybody watched the same shows and everybody had a kind of a sense of community based around what the kind of culture that they consumed. There were fewer books published, people read, you know, and there was certainly no internet. So there was a real um, sense that culture was something that a lot of people were invested in the same sort of cultural objects, the same sort of things that were being produced. Um, and that started to atomize, of course, with like cable TV and, and, and the changes in the publishing industry, especially in the 80s and 90s. Um, and now to the point where people have a very sort of curated experience of culture, like people are able to sort of consume what they want um, and it and the, at most they sort of share that with a sort of subgroup but there's no sort of national sort of uh, 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 sense of culture that kind of unites people there's not like tv shows that everybody watches i mean maybe game of thrones <laughs> is as close as you can get to something like that but um this is not a promo for game of thrones <laughs> it really isn't i don't know where this would come from um uh, <laughs> um so uh, what the political consequences of that, I think, you know, that's where it's a little bit worrying because you saw the, the what's so fascinating about the sort of the troll farm stuff, the, the idea of the, this kind of Russian uh, 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 building in which these guys were just th throwing out Facebook memes was kind of how crude it all was and how easily you could see through most of it and how kind of unsubtle it was compared to much of the sort of the ideals of what cultural propaganda constituted in the Cold War era where, you know, you know, one of this, 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 the key um, stories that I try and tell in the book is that the CIA were kind of supporting like social Democrats and left of center writers because they wanted it to be a kind of more, they felt that was a better alternative to communism, but they also didn't want to support kind of really like hardline anti-communists. So they took this kind of much more sophisticated and thoughtful approach to how they wanted to do their propaganda. Whereas this stuff is, you know, like crazy lies about Hillary Clinton is, is it, it, you know, it's worrying that, that a lot of that seemed to gain some traction or that, that even that even if it didn't, the idea that the Russians thought that it would is kind of <laughs> speaks to the, the, the way that, um, this stuff has become atomized and people are kind of consuming culture within a bubble. It's the same with the rise of conspiracy theories, you know, the QAnon stuff uh, that, that a lot of people are buying into. Um, you just, it, that's, that can only be consumed <laughs> within the privacy of, 
you know, your own laptop or with like like minded people, because you start talking about QAnon or Pizzagate and people are going to be, you know, regular people will just disabuse you of, of, of the absolute nonsense of it very quickly. So, I mean, it's hard to see. You can't put a stopper back in. That would be a bad thing. But I think, you know, there, there is increasing interest in um, among uh, the, in the way that we teach the humanities and the way that people are teaching in schools and helping people become better critical readers of this mass of information and these new forms of information that perhaps, perhaps we've been a little complacent with. Um, not everywhere, but perhaps in, in some places we've become a little complacent in helping people read and understand um, uh, what, how, how people are seeking to manipulate them through the written word and through, through various different ways on, 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 online. Um, I have been told we have time for one more question, and you're the winner. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Easy one. Yeah, easy, uh, easy one, <laughs> for sure. Um, so bearing in mind that there are all sorts of problematic industrial complex, problematic CIA involvement around the world, mm -hmm. hopefully wars and stuff. Um, <laughs> one one uh, question I wanted to ask you, I've been thinking about this for a while, um, given sort of what seems to me like some sort of existential identity confusion politically in the West post-Cold War, when you were writing this, did you read nostalgia for the Cold War, for that time period, the way in which I think having an enemy sharpens your sense of yourself? Mm. Um, or I, I also think about you know, some of the things around civil rights that mm -hmm. has to be firmly put in that context as well, of having this, al this alternative around equality. Mm -hmm. Were there any things about it that you look at and say, that was a time in which this was uh, preferable, special? Did you have any nostalgia for that time period? Oh, it's interesting. So, sorry. Oh, sorry, yes. Just to, to distill that um, as best I can, the question is, you know, Comparing the world of the Cold War versus the world we are in today, you know, do you have any nostalgia for that period? Yeah. Um, so Le Carre wrote at the end of the Cold War that the, you know, the right side had lost, but the wrong side had won. You know, there was this sort of sense that um, there was a real, in the 90s, there was a real triumphalism uh, about, about victory in the Cold War. The sort of... The end of history for Fukuyama, and and you know he gets he really uh, gets it's dragged into the center of that. And I talk about him a little bit in the book, but this was this idea that that okay we're done. Like the, this was the last this was the last bogeyman. We did the Nazis. Now we've done we've done the Soviet Union, and now it's this is the best system. We've come to the idea of the best system, and uh, we will now see the spread of. Of democratic capitalism around the world and and people's lives will get better and the quality of life will go up and 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 it's it's all over the end of history was this idea and then there was the yugoslav war and and this suddenly the idea of of kind of ethnic tension and conflict but that then was seen as sort of a bump in the road and then there was the rise of islamic fundamentalism uh, which interestingly you know was totally tied up with uh, the way the Cold War had been prosecuted. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the Mujahideen who were fighting in Afghanistan had got themselves, uh, actually they weren't American weapons, they were Czech weapons that the Americans had, had given to them, um, CIA, vast CIA investment in, in, in paying for these guys because they were fighting the Soviet Union and, and, and it, you know, it seemed like a good deal to make. Um, lo and behold, unintended consequences. Um, and the same, you know, with, with, uh, you know, when the Berlin Wall came down, one of the KGB agents in actually um, who, who was sort of stationed in East Germany at the time was Vladimir Putin, who, you know, saw this sort of great shame. He was, he was a reformist. He believed in Gorbachev, but um, he also believed in the Soviet Union as power, Russia as a power. And, and that humiliation was another one that's sort of an unintended consequence that would come back to bite. So the Cold War never, the Cold War sort of, has its legacies and that 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 kind of complacency at the at the end of it uh, has not history has not looked kindly upon on people that that bought into that too easily having said that we do live in a moment that's very nostalgic for the cold war mm -hmm. 
whether, and it, we think about the culture that we consume, shows like The Americans and um, Breach of Spies and the, the umpteen Le Carre adaptations and um, this kind of fascination with this period, partly because of the, the clear lines of the demarcation and the sense that, that ultimately um, the, the, the West was having to hold itself up to a, a slightly more a higher standard than the sort of grubby, cynical real politic of a Pompeo or somebody. Um, uh, but then, <laughs> but then you look at some of the stuff that did happen during the Cold War, and the way that the that the sort of the flip side of that is the the, the kind of the way that the conflict with the Soviet Union was used as an excuse to do a lot of unspeakable things. Mm -hmm. Um, and to also behave towards American citizens in, you know, COINTELPRO Co and, and all these kind of um, uh, infiltration of, of people's everyday lives by the FBI and the CIA, including the civil rights movement. A lot of the, the people in the civil rights movement um, uh, because of perceived communist threat. It, that's, that's not something to be nostalgic for. And, you know, it's why it's important that people keep thinking about and writing about and, and, and reflecting on the Cold War, you know. One of the things that, that perhaps really shocked me, there were many things that shocked me in doing the research, but I actually sort of read the, the Cy Hershey's account of, of My Lai again, and uh, which was this, you know, massacre during the Vietnam War. I mean, <laughs> you know, it is... Uh, one of the hardest things I've ever had to read um, and the Cold War created that situation where you know young American men did those things to, to people to other living human beings and and felt that it was part of some sort of larger goal so I, I do <laughs> sometimes get nostalgic for the kind of the, the sophistication and culture of the, of, of the statecraft and of the kind of politicians that we had and that were forced to have because they had to really have an A-game, um, <laughs> which is not always true of the current crop on both sides of the Atlantic, um, but not really for the, the Cold War too core. I think there was a lot, there, there's too much in that history that is too bloody and too, too bleak. All right. Well, on that sunny note. <laughs> um, Thank you.